Okay, but we'll go ahead and get started here with just some kind of basic introductions. Uh, I, my name is Nicole Tutman. I'm the chair of the in-house committee. I am an in-house counsel here at MetaBank. Uh, I am so happy today to have Megan Joyce with us. She's a partner at the Redstone Law Firm. Uh, for those of you who may practice employment law or you may occasionally practice employment law or you sit on boards where you need to know basic employment law, she has a really great blog that I like to follow. It's on LinkedIn. You can follow it however you follow blogs. Otherwise, that's how I kind of keep updated on some of the newest advancements and changes in the law. And I happened to see a number of recent posts and asked Megan if she'd come speak to our committee. And of course, we've opened it up to the rest of the state bar to join as well. So welcome to all of those who are not in-house counsel. Uh, Megan has a great presentation with us. She has a wealth of information. Uh, really interesting experience. She shared something actually with me today that I hope she shares while she's discussing that was just fascinating to think about from uh, an employment and kind of discrimination context. So I'm uh, really excited to have her. If you want to ask questions during the presentation, that's fine. If you want to chat them to me and I can ask them to Megan, that's fine. That way Megan doesn't have to uh, monitor the chat and I can certainly do that. Um, otherwise, I, we will facilitate some Q&A at the end. So thank you, Megan, for joining us. And I will just turn it over to you. Thanks, Nicole. Um, yeah, so like Nicole said, um, I've been practicing in the area of employment law um, for a little over 10 years. Um, in that practice, I've um, plaintiffed um, quite a number of um, employment discrimination, sexual harassment, retaliation, wrongful termination claims um, in the number of alphabet suit legislation that you encounter in employment law, ADA, ADEA, Title VII, FMLA, um, FLSA, all of them. Um, and I've, I've also defended um, a fair number of those lawsuits as well, both for um, private companies, municipalities, um, and governmental entities as well. Um, and also have done some more of the transactional employment practice, handbooks, policies, training, some of those sorts of things as well. So um, I've got some material here I'm going to cover. Um, I've identified sort of 10 of the top 10 or 10 issues that I think are kind of cutting edge in employment law. Um, things that have happened in the last year or two um, that I think are beneficial for everyone in this area to know. Um, and um, if you have any questions, feel free to jump in. Um, I would prefer to keep it fairly informal and talk through some of these things um, and um, kind of go from there in terms of what, what are some of the new issues in employment law right now? Um, so the first one I'm gonna talk about um, is a result of a memo that came from the NLRB General Counsel um, just a week or two ago. Um, and it kind of touches on this area of um, employer and employee speech um, and specifically also touches on the topic of corporate speech, um, which I think is sort of, um, a general topic of interest in the law right now. Um, so just last week, um, the general counsel for the National Labor Relations Board um, issued a memorandum regarding um, mandatory employee meetings. So it's long been recognized under the NLRA, the National Labor Relations Act, that employees are protected in terms of their right to listen to or refrain from listening to employer speech that relates to um, collective activity, uh, which is their ability to form or not form a union. Um, and in fact, it had been held quite a number of years ago that forcing employees to attend meetings under a threat of discipline where they listened to employer speech that discouraged them from um, joining or forming a union um, was inconsistent with the NLRA. Well, just a few years ago, um, during the Trump administration, the NLRB issued a decision that um, departed from that um, long held policy and held that an employer did not, in fact, uh, violate the NLRA by compelling employees to attend meetings in which 
corporate representatives would give speeches urging them to reject union representation. Um, and so as a result, for the last several years, there few years, there have been efforts by employers to use either implicit or explicit threats um, to force employees into meetings where they discuss the um, disadvantages primarily of unionization or other statutorily protected activity. So just last week, um, in an effort to reverse that policy, the general counsel for the NLRB issued a memorandum. Um, and the memorandum states, the license to coerce is an anomaly in labor law, inconsistent with the act's protection of employees' free speech. It is, a, it, is, it is based on a fundamental misunderstanding of employers' speech rights. I believe that the NLRB case precedent, which has tolerated such meetings, is at odds with fundamental labor law principles, our statutory language, and our congressional mandate. Because of this, I plan to urge the board to reconsider such precedent and find mandatory meetings of this sort unlawful. Now, um, in the last few years, these meetings have, like I said, become fairly common. Um, and so while labor unions have decried the practice, um, it's anticipated that, um, that bus the business lobby and right to work groups are going to try to push back um, and keep that policy in place. Now, the memorandum from the general counsel does not actually change policy. Um, in order to change policy, um, the NLRB would actually have to issue a decision that would be reviewable um, by the federal courts. Um, but it's anticipated that with this memorandum, the general counsel is signaling that she's going to be um, bringing an appropriate test case um, in an effort to change that law. Um, so there's probably going to be further developments on that and something to certainly keep our eye on. One of just one of the real concerns here um, is that if you read through the memorandum, there's some language in there. Um, that opens this up so broadly um, that a wide variety of employer meetings, perhaps even some meetings where training um, on um, things like Title VII and other policies is offered could run afoul um, of, the, of the policy that the general counsel is urging. So it's an important, important one to keep our eye on. So number nine I'm going to talk about is pregnancy accommodation laws. Um, you know, with what's going on in our labor market right now and the great resignation, uh, parental leave policies are really kind of a hot button issue um, in a way that employers are trying to market their businesses as being family friendly um, and allowing for a good work-life balance. So there's a move by employers to um, offer more friendly policies and as a corollary some states have also taken action in the last several months um, to enact pregnancy discrimination and accommodation laws and one of those states is minnesota actually um, so on january 1st of 2002 a new law came into effect in minnesota known as the pregnancy accommodation law the law um, in Minnesota states that an employer with 15 or more employers, with employees, which is a little bit different than the federal law, will beginning January 1st, 2002, be required to provide reasonable accommodations to an employee for health conditions related to pregnancy or childbirth upon request with the advice of a licensed healthcare provider, unless the employer demonstrates that the accommodation would impose an undue burden on the operation of the employer's business. And um, the bill also has provisions in it to um, allow accommodations, um, such as a temporary transfer to a less strenuous or hazardous position, um, allowing an employee to sit frequently, frequent restroom breaks, and limits on heavy lifting. Um, also, uh, when Minnesota Governor um, Tim Wells approved an amendment um, to that law relating to pregnancy accommodations, and as part of that amendment, um, he also included some provisions related to lactation breaks. Um, so now under Minnesota law, employers 
are required to provide employees who need to express breast milk for their infant child reasonable break times each day, which isn't that much different than um, the current federal law. Um, the amendment, though, also prohibits an employer from reducing an employee's compensation for time used for the purpose of expressing milk. Um, and it also includes language that limits an employer's obligation to the 12 months following the birth of the child. Uh, the lactation breaks may be scheduled um, over regularly scheduled rest or meal breaks, uh, but even if they are not, the employer cannot dock pay um, for taking reasonable lactation breaks, which is sort of interesting. Um, so that's a lot. If, you, if your business reaches into Minnesota, um, like I said, that came into effect on January 1st, 2002. Um, so that's also one that you'll want to keep an eye on. Uh, number eight is pay equity. Um, that's been a hot topic in the news. Um, as many of you perhaps know, um, earlier this year, the U.S. women's soccer team reached a $24 million settlement with the U.S. Soccer Federation in a several years long pay equity lawsuit um, that they have had. Um, so this year on March 15th of 2002, which is equal pay day. Um, that's the day at which it takes women to earn the equivalent that men earned in the prior year. Um, there were a number of ex executive orders that were signed um, in order to address pay equity and increase economic opportunity for women. Um, incidentally, March 15th of 2002 was the earliest that equal pay day has ever occurred. Um, in past years, based on the statistical wage gap between men and women, it's occurred much later in the year. So progress is being made. Um, so um, this law, this effort in some ways harkens back to uh, the Equal Pay Act, uh, which as many of you know, was first signed by President Kennedy in 1963. Um, and it was one of the very first federal anti-discrimination laws and it was the first to address wage differences based on gender. At its core, that act made it illegal to pay men and women working in the same place, different salaries for the same work. And during the signing ceremony, President Kennedy acknowledged the importance of a woman's earning power and the need for provisions that would allow her to reach her full earning potential, including better daycare services and tax deductions to cover the cost of such services, which is far, far ahead of its time. We'll talk a little bit about caregiver issues in a little bit. He also stated that the Equal Pay Act was only a first step and that much remained to be done to achieve full economic opportunity for women. And then following that following year in 1964, the Title VII of the Civil Rights Act was passed, which of course included the protections for discrimination on the basis of sex. And we'll talk about that here in a little bit as well. So um, the executive order that the White House signed has several different aspects, many of which um, apply primarily to federal employees, but there are a few provisions that also apply to federal contractors. Um, and so if any of your businesses are federal contractors, there are some things here that you will want to be aware of as well. Um, so first, um, there was an effort made by that executive order to advance pay equity for the federal workforce. Um, the Office of Personnel Management announced um, as part of that effort that they will be issuing a proposed regulation to address the use of prior salary history in the hiring and pay setting process for federal employees. Um, and that's also consistent uh, with um, some prior executive orders that were issued on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Second, um, this one relates to federal contractors. Um, the, President Biden signed an executive order directing the Federal Acquisition Regulatory Council to consider enhancing pay equity and transparency by limiting or prohibiting federal contractors from seeking and considering information about job applicants and employees existing or past compensation when making employment decisions. Um, so it's not at all uncommon for an employment application to ask for prior or past um, uh, salary information, but if you're a federal contractor, um, that may be limited. Also, it, it seeks to, there's an executive order that seeks to strengthen pay audits for federal contractors. Um, the Department of Labor's Office of Federal Contract Compliance 
issued a new directive clarifying federal contractors' annual obligation to analyze their compensation practices. Um, there's also um, an effort to ensure equitable access to good paying jobs. A large part of the reason for that pay gap between men and women um, is that women are concentrated in low wage sectors. Um, and so as part of this executive order, um, the Department of Labor also issued a report analyzing that impact um, on the concentration of women in low wage sectors and what effect that has on the overall economic security um, of women. And then finally, um, as part of that effort, there was also a move to address discrimination against care, caregivers. And I'll talk a little bit more in a, in a little bit more detail about that here in just a little bit. Um, but the, as the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission did publish some technical assistance specifically um, on the issue of caregiver um, discrimination. So like I said, a lot of those efforts are aimed at federal employees, but some of them do touch on federal contractors. Um, so those are all things that you'll want to be aware of as well. Number seven, um, medical marijuana. Um, so this has been a hot topic for a number of years um, in states across the country, but of course it's now making its way into South Dakota. So as we all know here in South Dakota, recreational marijuana, um, was part of Amendment A, and as a result of the decision by the South, South Dakota Supreme Court, it was held that that amendment was improperly submitted to the, to the voters and therefore was invalid. So recreational marijuana is not legal in South Dakota. Medical marijuana, on the other hand, is. Um, and so in the last several months, uh, we've seen various municipalities uh, rolling out their programs um, for medical marijuana. And as those programs get up and running and more and more people are taking part of that part in them, um, the reality of medical marijuana in the workplace is gonna be something that we are all going to have to confront. That in and of itself could be an entire presentation. Um, so I'm just gonna spend five minutes or so um, to just sort of touch on that issue in fairly broad strokes. Um, I will say, though, that I think that Minnesota, um, again, has just re recently um, addressed this issue, um, and it wouldn't be at all surprised if, in, in many ways, South Dakota sort of follows suit. Um, so Minnesota has had a Medical Cannabis Act on the book since 2014, um, and that law allows access to medical cannabis in the state, um, restricts who can utilize the program, and also restricts what types of delivery methods are available and are protected under that act. What's interesting in Minnesota though, um, is that their act also does include specific employment protections for people that qualify um, for the program. Um, so as of February of 2002, uh, Minnesota had 58,000 patients um, enrolled in their program, and that program is only expected to grow exponentially um, over the next several um, months and years. So there were a couple um, amendments made to the Minnesota Act just last month. Um, first, um, under Minnesota law, it is illegal to smoke cannabis in any public place or any place of employment. Um, and also they um, changed the definition of medical cannabis a, a bit um, to allow delivery of medical cannabis um, in a few different ways. Um, I think though that the most important thing that employers need to keep in mind when it comes to um, medical marijuana, um, both under the Minnesota Act and, and, and just generally, is that safety of employees always comes first. Um, it's true under the ADA um, as well that essentially safety, um, threats to um, the health and safety of other workers, OSHA, always trumps um, these issues. And so if you are an employer and you are concerned that an employee may be using medical marijuana, um, you have every right um, to know whether they are under the um, influence of that substance. Um, and whether they are especially coming to work um, under the influence. Now, the thing I will say, especially now that medical marijuana is legal, um, is that those situations do need to be addressed on a case-by-case -case basis. 
while in certain circumstances termination might be an option, um, it's important to have that conversation with the employee um, if a drug test does come back positive um, to discuss those safety concerns with them, discuss the reasons that they're using medical marijuana with them, um, and reach that decision um, based on that individual's particular circumstances uh, rather than having a right, right, right line rule. Um, so a couple tips for employers um, before as this issue sort of rolls out um, is to first take a look at your drug testing policies. Um, if you haven't updated your drug testing policy in the last year or two, um, that's probably something um, that you should take a look at, especially, um, like I said, with these medical marijuana issues coming about, um, you will want to take a closer look at that. Second, look at whether, like I said, your policy um, allows applicants or employees to explain a positive result on a drug test. Um, not only is medical marijuana an issue now, but there are a lot of other drugs um, that can flag on a drug test. I mean, there's some seizure medications that have cocaine in them, for instance. Um, and so you, again, don't want to just have a bright line rule that if a, if a drug test comes back positive, you're going to terminate them. You want to make sure that you have an individualized conversation with them about their circumstances. Um, also, um, again, with medical marijuana, does your um, handbook address um, how, you're, how you plan to confirm whether or not an individual has appropriately enrolled in the medical marijuana program? So in other words, if you have an employee that tests positive for marijuana, um, what procedure are you going to have to ensure that that person is actually using marijuana medicinally? rather than recreationally, um, because those two situations will likely need to be addressed differently um, in your handbook. And then finally, do you have a policy regarding possession and use of medical marijuana on the job? Um, and, and each one of those situations should be addressed differently. Um, you know, like again, going back to safety concerns, the use of medical marijuana on the job is, is one thing, but what if you've got an employee that um, uses it medicinally and just has some of it in his in her purse? Um, how are you going to deal with those situations? Um, so those are all things that you'll want to make sure um, that you are addressing in your employee handbook. Um, and back to Minnesota, they do have a um, Drug and Alcohol Testing Act. Um, and there's a couple interesting provisions in there that everyone should be aware of. So in Minnesota, it is um, against the law to terminate employees who test positive for the first time, um, except in limited circumstances. Um, so they do have a um, allowance for a first strike, so to speak. Also in Minnesota, you can't withdraw a job offer to a job applicant based on a positive result from that initial screening test alone. Again, you have to have that conversation with them um, about the reasons that the drug test might have come back positive. In Minnesota, failure to follow um, any of those provisions can subject you to severe financial penalties. Um, so it's a good idea to stay up to date on those, especially if your business reaches into Minnesota. Uh, number six, um, this one is, um, a couple years old, but perhaps something that not everyone is aware of. Um, Title VII now extends to sexual orientation and transgender status. Um, so as we all know, in looking at employee handbook policies, there's always the familiar list of protected classes under Title VII, race, color, sex, religion, national origin, ethnicity, et cetera. But you'll also now want to make sure that your handbook policies include gender identity and sexual orientation in that list of protected classes. In June of 2020, in Bostick versus Clay County, Georgia, the United States Supreme Court ruled that Title VII of the Civil Rights Act also does protect gay and transgender workers from workplace discrimination. Um, in that particular case, um, and a county had fired Gerald Bostick for conduct unbecoming a county employee shortly after he began participating in a gay recreational softball league. 
Um, and in, in the decision authored by Chief Just, or excuse me, Justice Neil Gorsuch, the court held that employer who fires an individual merely because that individual is gay or transgender violates Title VII because, quote, sex plays a necessary and undisguisable role in the decision, which is exactly what Title VII forbids. In reaching that decision, the court um, did a very, um, did a fairly simple, ordinary, and plain meaning analysis of the language of Title VII. Um, again, Title VII clearly states that um, discrimination on the basis of sex is um, unlawful, and the court concluded that the term sex refers to biological distinctions um, between males and females, and therefore does include discrimination on the basis of um, sexual orientation um, and gender identity. Um, in the wake of this decision, um, it would be wise to not only make sure that your policies are updated, but also do some training with your employees and your managers on this issue. Um, in the wake of the Me Too movement a couple of years ago, um, I know that the EEOC took a particular interest in sexual harassment cases. Um, and so I wouldn't be at all surprised if um, we see in the next several years that the EEOC um, runs a few of these sexual orientation and gender identity discrimination cases down the line um, to try to push the law um, even further um, towards those protections. So um, it's Bostick versus Clayton County. Um, it's an interesting read. Um, for um, an expansion of Title VII based on the plain and ordinary meaning of the statute, which isn't something that you always see. Um, so number five is um, hair discrimination. You might've heard about this a bit in the news um, in the last several um, weeks. This isn't final yet. We haven't heard the final word on this. Um, it was just some legislation that was passed by the House, but not yet the Senate. Um, so I'm not sure that it will become law, federal law yet, but it is a trend that is sweeping the country. So hair has been an issue um, for particularly for black women in schools and in the workplace for decades. Um, a 2019 study confirmed that black women report being 30% more likely to receive a formal grooming policy in the workplace when 80% of black women report that they have felt a need to change their hairstyle to align with more conservative standards in order to quote, fit in um, at work. Hair discrimination is defined as the prejudice, prejudicial treatment based on an individual's natural hairstyle in the workplace, housing, and schools. Um, in 2017, in EEOC versus Catastrophe Management Solutions, the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals took this issue up and in that case, the court actually held that banning dreadlocks in the workplace under a race neutral grooming policy did not constitute race based discrimination. Um, so in that case, the court effectively held that refusing to hire an individual because they have dreadlocks or cornrows um, or any other ethnic hairstyle is entirely legal. Um, but that's changing. Um, in 2019, California became the first state to pass some um, legislation that specifically addresses hair discrimination. Um, they did that by amending the definition of race um, in their Fair Employment and Housing Act to include traits that are historically associated with race, um, including hair texture and other protective hairstyles. Um, the California Act specifically prevents enforcement of grooming policies that claim to be race neutral, but effectively have a disproportionate negative impact on people of color. So in South, for instance, think about in South Dakota, um, if you had a policy that prohibited men from having long hair, right? That's on its face racially neutral, um, but you can easily see how in South Dakota that would have a disproportionate negative impact on Native American men, um, for instance. Similarly, um, the New York City Commission on Human Rights has adopted guidelines under which it can impose a penalty on those who harass, demote, or fire individuals because of their hair. 
Um, and then in 2019, New York became the second state to pass the Hair Discrimination Act. Um, and in December of 2019, New Jersey became the third state. Um, since then, 22 other states, including Minnesota and Nebraska, um, have all considered similar legislation. So then just um, a month or so ago, Congress also added itself to that list. On March 18th, the U.S. House of Representatives passed the CROWN Act, and CROWN is an acronym for Creating a Respectful and Open World for Natural Hair. And like many other prior versions of the law in the states, the law centers on banning hair discrimination in employment, housing, and public access accommodations. Like I said, it has yet to make its way into the Senate, where it's anticipated it will um, meet much stiffer opposition. But even without the federal law, as, these, as this legislation makes its way across the states, um, employers should be doing what they can um, to prevent discrimination on the basis of hairstyles and texturing um, by providing employee training on these issues and making sure to um, take a look at their employee, their employee policies to ensure that they truly are race neutral, not just in language, um, but also in effect. I um, talked with Nicole a little bit about this issue this morning, and I told her that I frequently, like I said, I do employee training on discrimination and harassment, and hair discrimination is something that I've talked about. And the way that I present this issue is I ask everybody to close their eyes and pretend that you're a manager and you're hiring for a receptionist position. In your mind, what does that receptionist look like? Just take a minute and think about that. What does the receptionist look like? And open your eyes. I venture to guess that the receptionist was a white woman, middle-aged, blonde hair, cut in a bob. <laughs> she wasn't a black woman with dreadlocks. Um, and I think that you know we get into trouble a lot of times on these on these issues when we keep when we have that default in mind, um, and we either intentionally or unintentionally punish someone for their deviation from the default or the norm that we have preconceived in our mind. Um, and I, I like I said, I think a lot of times it's unconscious. We don't even really realize that we're doing it. Um, but I think this hair discrimination is one of those issues that really highlights that um, for us. And, you know, like a, the example of the receptionist with dreadlocks or the Native American man with, with long hair, um, you know, those are deviations from the norm. Um, and we want to be ensure, ensure that our managers are aware that that can happen and that they aren't discriminating against people on that basis. Now, all that being said, safety again is always a concern. And so if you've got um, an employee that's working around machinery, there's absolutely a good reason not to allow an employee to have hair down to their waist. Um, or if it's a food service job, there's very legitimate reasons for making sure that people um, don't have facial hair or that they have that hair covered. Um, but we just wanna make sure that when we enact those policies, we're doing it in a race neutral and fair manner not unnecessarily punishing people for the deviation from the norm. So. Uh, number four, um, and this is a really, really hot topic. Um, there was recently a federal law that was actually passed that um, nixes forced arbitration of sexual harassment claims. Um, like I said, I have litigated um, a fair number of plaintiffs' employment cases, and this issue has cropped up more than once um, in cases that I've dealt with. So. As many of you know, it's not at all uncommon for employers to present potential new employees with an arbitration agreement at the time of hire or an employment agreement that includes an arbitration provision before they start the new position. Now, in some cases, those arbitration agreements are actually on a hard copy piece of paper that's presented to them and they sign them, um, but the... Um, more nefarious practice, as I'll call it, um, is when those agreements are presented to a potential new employee as part of an online application in a click-through form, or 
Um, in some cases, uh, an employee will simply be presented a piece of paper or an online form that says that they have access to certain policies that are available on their company internet without actually saying what those policies are. Um, and one of those policies may in fact be an arbitration provision. Um, like I said, I've dealt with this before um, on the behalf of employees, um, fought the law and the law won. Um, they're incredibly difficult um, to get around. I mean, it, it's always seemed to me that Title VII was enacted with fee shifting top provisions in order to make it easier for employees to bring those types of claims and to incentivize lawyers to bring them. Um, and it always seemed to me that these arbitration agreements somehow ran counter to that public policy. And the EEOC has in fact issued some guidance on that and they agree. Um, but the, um, the case law is decidedly against the EEOC on that issue. Um, in every instance, the um, federal courts have sided on the, um, with the language of the FF, FAA, uh, which provides that written agreements to arbitrate are valid, irrevocable, and, and, and enforceable. Um, and so despite those efforts that various litigants have made over the years um, to avoid arbitration agreements in the employment context, those efforts have, have inevitably failed. So a new law was passed just a few months ago uh, to address this issue, particularly with relate, with, in relation to sexual assault and sexual harassment claims. Um, so in February, Congress passed and President Biden signed the Ending Forced Arbitration of Sexual Assault and Sexual Harassment Act of 2021, which amends the FAA to give employees who are parties to arbitration agreements with their employers the option of either bringing their claims of sexual assault or sexual harassment in either arbitration or a court of law. So there's a couple key points that everyone should keep in mind. First, it's significant that the act only applies to a case which is filed under federal, tribal, or state law and relates to sexual assault and sexual harassment claims. As of right now, um, arbitration agreements relating to any other um, employment claims remain valid. Um, so if it's a race discrimination claim, if it's a racial harassment claim, a religious discrimination claim, the FAA still controls. That said, um, the, the Biden administration has signaled that they're looking forward to working with Congress to address the enforceability of arbitration agreements in all of those other situations as well. Um, so there may be further changes along those lines as well. Second, um, the act invalidates arbitration agreements for sexual assault and sexual harassment claims arising after the date of the act's enactment. So, it only applies to claims for sexual harassment and sexual assault that happened after February of 2002 um, or 2022. If it's any claim that occurred before then, the arbitration agreement is still enforceable. And then finally, um, despite the act, um, if an employee does has signed an arbitration agreement and they decide that they do want to arbitrate, um, they are entirely free to do so. Um, they can litigate in federal court, but they certainly don't have to. Um, and, you know, arbitration has a lot of advantages and disadvantages, but confidentiality um, is certainly one of the benefits of arbitration. And so um, even if an employee has the option of bringing a claim for sexual assault or sexual harassment in federal court, um, he or she may choose to arbitrate it um, in order to gain that confidentiality. Um, so um, again, if your employment agreements have arbitration provisions in them, you'll want to take a look at those and make sure that you're carving out sexual assault and sexual harassment claims. So Megan, we've got a question on this yeah. one. So is the state law on arbitration clauses where the employee might not be aware they agreed to them similarly developed as in the new federal laws? And um, this is from Ryan. So I don't know if Ryan's got particular color, but maybe give us a little flavor of what South Dakota law has said on these arbitration provisions? I haven't looked at it um, 
in the state law context. Um, I've only looked at it in the federal law context. Um, yeah, and I mean, it really comes down to, in those situations, a meeting of the minds analysis, right? I mean, of course, there's the, the mantra that if you didn't read the contract, but you signed it anyway, um, you can't claim ignorance to get out of it. Um, but if the contract is presented to you in such a way that you're not aware of all of its material terms, for instance, an arbitration agreement, and you can establish that you wouldn't have you wouldn't have agreed to that contract had you known about that provision. Um, I think you'd have a pretty good argument that there wasn't a meeting of the minds or mutual assent to all the terms. So I haven't looked into that issue. I've only looked into it on the federal level, though. That's just my two cents. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so number three, um, I foreshadowed this issue a little bit before. The EEOC has issued some guidance on um, caregiver discrimination. Um, and so I think some of this is of course driven by COVID, but I think some of it's also driven by um, changing demographics in our society. I, I attended a really interesting presentation on this a couple of years ago. So experts are warning of a coming age wave um, as global life expectancies rise. The World Health Report of 1998 marked the global life expectancy at 66 years. And they've projected it to rise to 73 years by 2025. Furthermore, the, F, the WHO expects that thousands of people who were born at the end of the 20th century will live through the 20th, 21st century and into the start of the 22nd century. Um, even today, the Pew Research Center reports that with the aging of baby boomers, about 10,000 people have been turning 65 every single day since 2011 and will continue to do so at this rate. I've even heard that in our generation, many of us can very reasonably expect to live to be at least 100 years old. So when you take those statistics and you look then also at the declining birth rate in many um, developed countries, you can see how we're really very quickly running into an inverted population pyramid. And these demographics are gonna have a significant impact on the workforce in the coming decades. More and more employers, employees are gonna find themselves in a sandwich generation where they're both simultaneously caring for young children and aging parents. And as birth rates are declining and as people are having children at a later age, the work of caring for older parents is increasingly gonna fall on just one or two children in the family rather than six or seven or eight children um, as it has in the past. Like I said, the COVID epidemic kind of gave us um, a preview of what's to come in terms of these issues of caregiver discrimination and how do we deal with that in the workplace. Um, but as these demographics play out over the next several decades, it's only going to become more and more of an issue. So in response to COVID, but perhaps also anticipating that these issues are on the horizon, the EEOC issued some technical assistance a few weeks ago to assist employers um, with navigating some of these new realities. The EEOC's technical assistance reminds us that discrimination against a person with caregiving responsibilities may be unlawful under federal employment discrimination laws. Caregiver discrimination can violate laws when it's based on employee sex, for instance, pregnancy, sexual orientation, or gender identity, age, 40 or older, disability or genetic information such as medical family medical history. But then I think this is also key. It's also unlawful um, if it's based on an applicant's or an employee's association um, with an individual with a disability within the meaning of the ADA or on the race, ethnicity, or other protected characteristic of the individual for whom care is provided. So if you have an employee who is a who is or a potential applicant who's applying for a job and is a mom with three kids, you also cannot discriminate on the basis of her assumed caregiving responsibilities. Um, if you're not hiring her because you think that she has responsibilities to care for those three children, that's unlawful um, under the federal laws. If you're hiring an older worker, um, who perhaps has a spouse 
um, and you don't who is disabled or elderly and you don't hire that individual um, because of the caregiving responsibilities that they may have for an elderly or disabled spouse, that can be unlawful under the Federal Employment Act. Um, so it's, a, it's important to understand that they don't, um, there, there is nothing in the text of the laws that specifically addresses caregiver discrimination, um, although there are some state and local laws that do. But you need to understand how um, those different characteristics and caregiving can overlap with the protected characteristics of the various federal employment laws and can run you into trouble. Of course, there's always the FMLA, um, um, and that also addresses caregiving responsibilities. Um, but I, I think that we probably haven't entirely thought through how um, caregiving responsibilities touch on some of those other protected characteristics. Um, so that's, again, just something you'll want to, a conversation that it's wise to have with your managers, and especially those with hiring responsibilities, um, to make sure that you're not unwittingly running afoul of those issues. Um, the second one um, I'll touch on is covenants not to compete. Um, so as many of us know, in South Dakota, contracts and restraint of trade um, which includes covenants not to compete are generally unenforceable as against public policy. But in South Dakota, our state law specifically carves out four situations in which covenants not to compete may be enforceable. And one of those is an employment contract um, or a relationship. And in doing so, South Dakota actually has one of the more permissible laws regarding covenants not to compete um, when compared to even some of our surrounding states. But a recent executive order seeks to change a lot of that. Um, in July of 2021, President Biden signed an executive order that set forth 72 different initiatives to address corporate co consolidation and increase competition. One of those initiatives calls upon the FTC to ban or limit covenants not to compete. Now, on the one hand, the White House contends that covenants not to compete limit competition by making it harder for tens of millions of Americans who sign them um, as a condition of getting a job to switch to better paying jobs. But on the other hand, the business community says that covenants not to compete are an important and necessary tool to protect goodwill, confidential information, and customer relationships. Now, that sounds scary. Um, in practical effect, the executive order um, doesn't have a lot of immediate teeth. Um, President Biden's ability to unilaterally influence policies and decisions of all of the independent agencies that would have to enforce that executive order is fairly limited, and any of those actions would ultimately be subjected to judicial review. So it remains to be seen whether he'll be um, effective or successful in implementing those changes. Um, but it's certainly something that we all need to be aware of, um, especially in South Dakota where covenants not to compete are pretty common. The last thing I'll talk about um, is um, the classification between independent contractors and employees. Um, I was at a conference a few years ago and um, it was in California and some of these issues were just starting to bubble up then. Um, with some of the legislation that was be con being considered in California at that time. But in the last several years, um, these, this issue has really taken off across the country. And I think a lot of that is driven by what I'll call the gig economy, um, which is Uber drivers, Lyft drivers, um, DoorDash, Grubhub, Sudshare. I don't know if you've heard about that. It's like Uber for laundry. Um, and so there's um, millions and millions of workers, especially in light of COVID, that are leaving the traditional workforce and are um, going into those types of positions. And I, I think that a lot of states are grappling with how exactly to classify those individuals, um, because in some ways they fit the definition of employees and in some ways they don't. Um, and so it's going to be really interesting to see how some of those issues um, play out in the next several years. Um, and I, I see that Nicole um, put my the web address for my blog 
Um, and I have two blog posts on this issue, and one of them has a link to an article um, that was in the Sioux Falls Business Journal several months ago. And it's a specifically about an employee, an individual here in Sioux Falls who had a traditional job and left that job um, to go do a gig job and sort of why she did that and how much money she was able to make doing it. And it talked about that in the context of the labor shortage um, that we're all experiencing. It was really, really fascinating um, to kind of hear her thoughts um, on why she made that decision for herself. So if you go to my blog, you can find that link. It's really amazing. So there's just two things I just want to talk about real briefly here. Um, the first is, like I mentioned, there's a there's a lot of legislation that's working its way across the country um, on this issue. Um, and most recently, there was some legislation in Washington um, that um, deals with um, Uber, Lyft, and other gig drivers and contemplates whether those types of drivers should be afforded certain benefits and protections um, that are usually afforded to employees while at the same time not going all the way and actually classifying them as employees. So as you know, employees um, usually work for one employer they have hours that are set by that employer. They work at the employer's place of business and under the control and direction of the employer. And in return for some of that control over the means of their work, they're eligible for unemployment compensation, workers' compensation. Um, they're covered by federal and state wage and hour laws. They have the protection of workplace safety laws and employment anti employment anti discrimination laws. And they're also able to join a union. Now, independent contractors, on the other hand, um, are free to work the hours that they want. They work at their own office or out of their own home. And they entirely are able to go about deciding how they want to accomplish the tasks without any input from others. But in exchange for that flexibility, they give up a lot of those protections like, um, like unemployment, workers' compensation, workplace safety. Um, and the ability to join or form a union. And like I said, in South Dakota, because we allow um, covenants not to compete for um, employees, but not for independent contractors, um, this classification of workers is really important in South Dakota. So the, there's some Washington legislation that has tried to push the envelope on that. And uh, for the sake of time, you can go look at my blog and I kind of run through what all the details of that are. But it's really just the last of several efforts um, in other states, including New York and California, to try to clean up um, this issue. And I, I think that this is something that, although it may not have made its way um, into South Dakota yet or into our neighboring states, it's certainly something that we will have to grapple with sooner or rather than later. Um, and then on this topic, also um, just last week, um, the National Labor Relations Board General Counsel um, also um, sought to address this issue as well. Um, so um, it's long been held that under the NLRB, simply misclassifying a worker as an employee versus an independent contractor without something more um, is not a violation of the NLRA. Um, just simply misclassifying them is not a violation. Um, but um, more recently, um, and actually that came out of a case, um, Velox Express Inc. and Jan Jeannie Ledge. Um, she was a driver for a company called Velox Express, and she was fired because she was raising group complaints about the conditions of employment. Um, at that, in that company, drivers were required to sign independent contractor agreements. And she began discussing work-related issues with other drivers, and she started to question whether they were really appropriately classified as independent contractors or whether they were more appropriately classified um, as employees. She brought a complaint, um, and she argued that they should have been classified as employees. And Velox argued that they were independent contractors and that they weren't therefore even protected under the NLRA. Um, but the, the board agreed that they were employees um, and that VLOX violated the NLRA 
when it fired her for raising group complaints about the job. But because she was fired for raising complaints, um, the co- you know, in that case, she was she was fired for raising the complaints, um, and that was held to be a violation. The board did not say that the classification itself, misclassification itself, was a violation of the NLRA. Um, so, very recently, the NLRB's general counsel is going to be seeking to challenge that holding. Um, she issued a complaint against five trucking, warehouse, and logistics companies, alleging that their mere classification of workers as independent contractors without anything more was in, its, in and of itself a violation of the NLRA. And so through that case, she's going to be um, seeking an order um, that changes that um, existing law and also forces that company and many others um, to take a closer look at their classification of workers as independent contractors or employees. Um, So that's all I have. Um, I'll open it up to any broader questions. Um, I know that's a lot of information, um, but like I said, Nicole's got my blog. So if you wanna go look at any of those, and I try to include links to the executive orders or the guidance that comes out from the EEOC that you, so that you can go and look for yourself at those documents that I'm talking about. And I try to post an update every week or so um, as well. So. Well, I will open it up to the group first with questions. Anybody have any questions for Megan? So Megan, I'm not gonna pepper you with questions on medical marijuana. This is something this group has talked about a lot in the employment context because it has an impact on a lot of our businesses and it's new for a lot of our businesses. Uh, But we may be back in touch to talk to you about it. (laughs) I won't do that, but I, I did just have just one question on that. When you're doing, uh, when you're having conversations with employees or they fail the drug test, what kind of documentation do you recommend the employer keep, you know, in that process and kind of how long do you have to keep it if you know off the top of your head? So I always say contemporaneous documentation is the best. Um, and um you know, to the extent that you can just keep notes um, of the conversations that you're having with the employee. Uh, I think sometimes even when it's a very sensitive conversation like that, I like to have more than one person in the room. Um, You can have one person talking and another keeping notes or both of you are talking and keeping notes. Um, you know, whatever the case might be, it just makes it easier in that situation that if there's later a question about he said versus she said, um, you've got two people in the room that can corroborate your side um, rather than just, you know, you against the employee. Um, Also, you know, as many of us are familiar in the practice of law and you have those verbal conversations followed up with an email to confirm what you've talked about. And to the extent that you can create forms ahead of time or templates um, to deal with those situations, I think that's a good idea too. Um, So, you know, if you have a form that uh, say an employee's drug test comes back hot um, and you have a form for them to fill out that asks for some basic information about what drug it is that they're taking, who prescribed it, how often, um, and then um, you can have that form in the file and have documentation that you had a conversation with it. Um, I'm a big fan of forms and checklists because they say they take some of the human error out of the equation. Very helpful. Thank you. I know we're at time and I know how sometimes our calendars get stacked, so we will not uh, pass you with questions, but I wanted to thank you. This was so helpful and interesting. And just a nice overview of some topics to really keep at the front of our minds. So thank you. Uh, her blog, blog post, again, is up in the chat. And House Committee, I'll make sure that it goes out in our next email. Uh, but thank you very much for joining us, Megan. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Yep. Bye-bye.